Hello class. I hope that I am recording and uh, everybody can see the tablet. Yes, I'm sure you can. Uh, today, uh, what I wanted to do was talk about uh, boundary, uh, transmission across a boundary, transmission across <laughs> across a boundary now when i say a boundary i mean a boundary uh between two different um materials with different relative permittivities right so you know let's say that this has a relative permittivity of one i'll just call that uh, uh epsilon sub r one uh, you know, and this material over here has a permittivity of epsilon r2, right? Because everything over here is a two, and everything over there is a one, and uh, that's what I wanted to point out. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is where I like to talk about um, skin depth penetration, right? So skin depth penetration into a conductor, and you've all been told, well, there is no penetration into a conductor. Well, how do we, how do we communicate with submarines then? Because <laughs> water is a conductive medium, uh, and salt water, oh, do I hit, do, is that okay? Yeah, I think I'm still okay. And salt water is a very conductive medium. In, medium. And um, I just wanna point something out to you, right? Distilled water, is one ten thousandth the conductivity of seawater, and what what are the 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 charge carriers in seawater? It's the sodium chloride ions, isn't it? The sodium ions and the chloride chlorine atoms ions uh, in the salt water that are the charge carriers predominantly. It's not the electrons, right? So uh, that's right, and, and so I always like to make this joke with the class that. You know, uh, whenever I, uh, whenever someone's going to assassinate me and I'm taking a bath and they walk in to the bath and they think that they're going to, uh, you know, electrocute me, throw that thing in there. Even regular bath water would electrocute you and kill you, right? Because it's got minerals in it similar to the seawater. Uh, regular tap water is not as conductive, of course, as seawater is, but uh, it's not as uh, non-conductive as distilled water. So wh what I do is I fill my bath with distilled water, and then when he throws the heater in there to kill me, ha! The joke's on him. It's distilled water. It's not conductive enough to even kill me, right? And then he probably pulls his gun out and shoots me in the head. <laughs> or whatever. He's there for a purpose. Or, 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 or maybe that's what I do. I don't know. I, I haven't written the movie yet. <laughs> but uh, I've got too much to do to be writing screenplays right now. So let's get back to this. You know, I also wanted to mention another thing. You know, uh, the, the reason at the end of the last thing, I, was, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, is the Laplacian, oh, oh, sorry, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I sort of bent that. Is the Laplacian, uh, th should that have an arrow over the top of it? And I always thought to myself, because you know, you see it in literature and the Laplacian sort of looks like it's in bold anyway in literature. And, and when they're writing in literature, they mainly bold out uh, vectors, right? So, um, I thought to myself, well, you know, the Dell operator obviously is, is the Laplacian operator, and I don't think it is. I don't think that there's an arrow over the top of the Laplacian. And so I want to point out another thing, too. You know, you can, uh, of course, write the Laplacian like that, but you could, uh, there's also a convention of writing the Laplacian like this. Um, because actually this, I, I think, can be used for another thing too, the Hermitian or something, I, I, or Hesh, I can't remember. But uh, 
you know, this, a lot of times you'll see that. And, and a lot of times you'll think that's the Dell. I mean, not the Delta, I say the Delta, right? You know, like uh, Delta V or whatever. Doesn't that look just like Delta? I think it's Delta. So I, anyway, uh, I just thought I would point that out to you. Um, all right, now let's get back to this. In fact, I, ca I didn't want to stick that up there. I probably should have just stuck that up there on the top rather than putting it down here. But you'll remember it this way, that's for sure. Right. So that's another uh, notation for the Laplacian. All right, now let's get back to this. Now, what happens when an electromagnetic wave, let's say an electromagnetic wave is coming in like this to a boundary between two different dielectrics, right? Two different dielectrics. What's going to happen across that boundary? Um, this is what's going to happen. The tangential electric field. So E tangential one is going to be equal to E tangential two. You know what I mean by by that? Let's let's go back here and just sort of look at these uh uh you know, theta one, theta two, and how all of the geometry goes together uh, with this. Now, if I'm looking at the first electric field right here, this would be E sub N. Does everyone see that? E sub N one. And this would be E sub T one, all right? Hey, I actually came out pretty good uh, with that um, red pen and it's so thick. I'll tell you, it's a very thick pen. <clears throat> Looks pretty good here, doesn't it? Now, what I wanna do is I wanna do the same thing over here. Now this is E sub T one. So this, right, is going to be, uh, God, where can I put this? Uh, E sub T two. Wow, you can hardly see the two there, but that's E sub T two. Two, uh, no, you can't see it at all. I don't know, uh, uh, should have drawn it bigger. <laughs> and so this is E sub N two, all right? So those are the, uh, the individual uh, components uh, of those, I probably shouldn't have put, because uh, it really is just a component. I should really say even E sub T, uh, I, could even, I, I could even call that something else. But anyway, these, uh, the, the tangential component of E1 vector and the tangential component of the E2 vector have to be equal. This is the condition. Those two things have to be equal in, a bound, in, in uh, an electromagnetic wave crossing a boundary. We've got a lot to talk about with electromagnetic waves crossing the boundary. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you that right now. I've got, I've got a, a more than one lecture to talk about uh, in this topic. And I did set the timer, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, let's get back to this. So now, if I know that that's the tangential component Let's just look at that, um, uh, at that triangle. Now I know that this angle down here, right? That's theta sub one, right? So that means in this, in this triangle, this vector triangle I have right here, uh, this right here, I hope everybody can see that. Let me just check that out. That angle right there is also theta sub one, isn't it? Well, you can't see that. But yes, 
alternating internal angles between two parallel lines are going to be the same angle. That's the geometrical identity that I'm using there. So if this is theta one right here, right, right between there, right between there, then this alternate internal angle also has to be theta one, doesn't it? So when I'm talking about E tangential, I'm really talking about, uh, let's just do it over here, E one times the cosine, right? Let me just, E one times the cosine of theta one equals E two times the cosine of theta two. Does everyone see that? Oh, did, did I say? Oh my God! Did I, <laughs> oh, I've gotten ahead of myself. Anyway, sorry about that. That's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm already up to the flux. In my head and in my notes over here, I'm up to the flux. <laughs> of course, that's not cosine, it's sine, right? And I should say, hey, why didn't anybody say anything? But of course, nobody is really here. I'm just talking to myself and the teacup. Now, uh, so E1 sine 1 theta sine theta one equals e2 sine theta two because of course here is theta two let's just draw that in there right because here is theta two right there i screwed that up too have i do i have to do this whole thing all over again no 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 i got it okay uh so there you go that would be tangential. Yeah, no, 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 I, everything looks fine. So <clears throat> what's the other criteria, the other requirement? Well, the other requirement is that dn1 equals dn2. I'll make those capital letters. How about that? So the normal e, dn, and, and we know that d equals epsilon e, right? We know that D equals epsilon E. And so if we, if we know this, then that tells us that epsilon E1 times the cosine of theta, oh, epsilon 1, E1, I got it, okay, yeah, I got that. Um, you know, I could have written that better, maybe. Anyway, uh, I'll write it uh, better on the other side. Uh, equals uh, epsilon 2 E2 times the cosine of theta 2. All right. <clears throat> so there we go. We uh, Let me have a little sip here. Hmm. So we have our two requirements uh, for the propagation across uh, that boundary. And what I was thinking of was to, uh, now, uh, you know, I wanna look at a special case first. Uh, what if I have a conductor, and we know in a conductor that the electric field in the conductor, E2, is, is zero, right? Uh, and so um, that tells me that uh, uh, E1 times sine theta one uh, also has to be zero, right? So in that means since E1 isn't, isn't zero, then sine theta one has to be zero. And that means that uh, alpha one has to be zero. Now, 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 I'm going to show you this in several different ways, but uh, let's just do it. Let's just do it in the first way first. I'm not sure if everybody was uh, entirely listening to me, <clears throat> but uh, uh, let me uh, 
let me do it this way first. So if, if we know that there's no electric field that can exist inside a conductor, and we know that E2 has to equal zero, right? E2 has to equal zero volts per meter. Well, if that's true, let's, uh, let's go back up to this because if E2 is zero, then zero times this is zero. I don't care what this is. Uh, I know what it is already anyway, but it's zero. And then uh, over here, well, if uh, E1 times sine theta one equals zero, so if E1 times sine theta one also has to equal zero, right? Then <coughs> E1 isn't equal to zero, so sine theta one has to equal zero, right? So sine theta one has to equal zero or theta one has to equal zero degrees, right? Now, if this is equal to zero degrees, what does that mean? That means that if I have a conductor, right? So I have a conductor here, and I've got an electric field coming into the conductor, which I mentioned before when we were drawing electric field lines in one of the earlier uh, lectures. When I have <laughs> an electric field line coming into a conductor, by my, uh, by my proof right here, it has to come in at 90 degrees to the conductor, right? Because what is theta one? Theta one is off the normal, right? This is my normal to the surface. So theta one is off there. So, so if theta one is off there and theta one is zero, then that means that the electric field line has to come in directly, directly perpendicular to the surface. And that's how it's got to meet up with the surface of a conductor. And that, that, that tells me that uh, uh, all field lines have to come into a conductor that way. Now, I wanna prove this uh, in an opposite way too, right? Because if this equals this, and this equals this, and this equals this, and this equals this, right? Then why can't this over this equal this over this? Right, so, so if I have this divided by this, wouldn't that give me, I'm just gonna put a line down here. I don't want it to look like I'm adding anything. So I'm just gonna put sort of a squiggly line to show it's a different place. Why are all these pens running out of ink? I mean, I bought 20 for a dollar. I, I, can't, I can't see why they're not lasting forever. Oh, this one looks real sharp. All right, now let's divide this, right? This over this. So that gives me epsilon r1, I'll try to use the numbers off here now, times e1 sine divided by cosine gives me tangent, right? Tangent theta1. And then let's do the same thing to the other side. I've got the e epsilon, so I'm going to say epsilon sub r2 times e2 times tangent of theta two. Am I like blocking the camera? No. Okay, so uh, that uh, basically, uh, uh, I, I've just put those two together. So uh, let's, uh, uh, oh, you know, wait. I, I, yeah, yeah. I almost have to redo this. If I'm dividing this by this, what the heck is E1 doing there? E1, you're not there. You're not there. I'm going to make him disappear. <laughs> Where is, there it is. Oh God. See, that's why I try to do them early in the morning and not later in the afternoon. All right, so it's the hard to, Wait, 
I'm rewriting that whole thing. <laughs> if I divide, I'm, I'm, look, I'm just going to put the divide line there so I can see it and I can do it correctly. Okay, now if I divide those two, this is what I get. I get one over epsilon sub r1 times tangent of theta one, and that equals one over epsilon r2 times the tangent of theta two. Okay, I, I had to sort of see those, I don't know. Don't know what I was thinking there for a second. So I've divided those, those two, and this tells me that the, tangent of theta two. So let me just, uh, let's go over here so I don't waste a lot of, uh, of the paper room. The tangent uh, of theta two is going to equal epsilon r two divided by epsilon r one times the tangent of theta one. Notice, by the way, when I'm talking about epsilon, I'm just talking about the relative here. And why do I say that? Because every time I have this here and you know I'm dividing it, uh, epsilon sub zero would just cancel out of that, wouldn't it? Right? So that's why I just am comparing really the relative now. But if I was gonna come up with an actual answer where I have to use uh, permittivity, I would always multiply the relative permittivity times the absolute permittivity, because that's what permittivity really is, isn't it? Uh, I've drawn that enough times. All right, let's get back to, to this then. Now, when we look at this equation right here, right? Uh, this, you know, what if this, the relative permittivity is much higher than this? Let's say that I'm going from air into water or something like that, right? Um, or glass or, or whatever. Um, so the relative permittivity is going to be higher and then uh, 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 tangent theta one. But what if this is much higher? What if it's super higher? In fact, what's really happening as this gets higher? What is really happening as this gets higher? As this gets higher, isn't, the, isn't theta two also getting higher? Right? Isn't theta two also getting higher. What if this was infinity? What if I had this? What if the relative permittivity of two of the whatever that material is, is infinity? Then the tangent of theta two would be infinity, wouldn't it? Or theta two would be the inverse, or uh, well, yeah, um, tangent of infinity. What is the inverse tangent of infinity? Ninety degrees. Right. So not only, not only, two things we've just done here. Not only have we proven that uh, any electric field that comes up to a conductor has to end at that conductor perpendicularly, right? It has to end, the electric field line has to end at the conductor perpendicularly. That's one thing. The second thing that we proved was that any electric field line that comes into a conductor, any electric field line that comes into a conductor, when it gets into the conductor, it has to go, well, I drew that badly, didn't I? It has to go, I drew that even worse, uh, perpendicular to the surface. So it can never penetrate the surface. It has to go at 90 degrees. This angle here, and let's not forget what that angle is. It's off the normal. 
It's the angle off the normal. So 90 degrees would make it look like it's right. I don't want to draw more on this figure, but it would make it look like it's right on this line right here going that way, not penetrating the, the thing at all, right? And that's because we know that the relative permittivity of any conductor is infinity. So I, I wanted to prove both of those two things that I've sort of talked about before in that earlier lecture where uh, you know I was showing how the electric field lines went in there. And, and I wanted to, you know, it's, it's one thing to just say it, it's another thing to actually show you the mathematics then that proves it. Okay, I'll put a box around here. I'm sorry I had to put that underneath there, but I just couldn't do it in my head watching those. It was like I was at, I couldn't, uh, whatever. So um, anyway, uh, that's uh, two things that I, I wanted to do. And, and now, of course, what I've told you, basically I've just theoretically derived the fact that these have to come in perpendicular and that they cannot penetrate the actual conductor at all. Now, in the second half of this lecture, I'm going to tell you that that's not true whatsoever. <laughs> if it was true, if it was true, we could not hear the radio in our car. Could we? No, we couldn't. But the truth is, and, and, and here's, and I've written this down before, I'm going to write it down again. The truth is that the skin depth penetration of the electromagnetic wave into a conductive medium, because no medium is a perfect conductor, is it? Right? Every medium has, you know, steel, aluminum, copper, they all have a certain resistivity that's associated with them. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to write this in two different ways and show you how the resistivity more so than the conductivity is really. But this is the way that you'll usually see the skin depth penetration uh, uh, equation written. All right. It's one divided by pi times the frequency times the permeability of the conductor. I got to write that down there, of the conductor. I write it down every time. I hate doing it, and especially here because you can hardly see it. But that's the permeability. Did I say relative permeability? No, I didn't say that. I said the permeability of the conductor. So remember, the permeability is equal to the relative permeability times the absolute permeability, and that is I just put a conductor down there, not, not to say that it's absolute or anything. It's just the permeability of the conductor, not of the dielectric. That's what I'm trying to point out. It's, it's of the conductor, the conductive media uh, permeability, uh, you know, not the uh, permeability of the material that's coming, that the wave is coming from or whatever. All right, okay, which is probably a dielectric of some kind. Now, um, times the conductivity of the conductor, and, and as I've said before, and this is all under uh, the square root, uh, as I've said before, the conductivity of the conductor uh, is the reciprocal right? The, the conductivity of a conductor is the reciprocal of the resistivity of a conductor. And just as an example, uh, the resistivity of um, copper is uh, 16, I think it's like 16.3 or something like that, but let's say 16 times 10 to the minus 9 ohm meters. Or I could write that as 16 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh, oh, wait. <laughs> I'm only like on cruise control. <laughs> there you go. I could say that it's 16. I'll even get rid of the times. <laughs> now I'm not even going to make you think about it. Ohm nanometers. There you go. The time that I was going to set aside to let you actually think of what it was is gone. 
I, I screwed that one up. So 16 ohm nanometers, which would be 16 times 10 to the minus nine ohm meters. <clears throat> and that's the resistivity, not the conductivity uh, of copper. But, you know, that's just one of the things that's, that, that we're gonna look at here. So I just thought that I would uh, bring that up. Now, what is the permeability? Right, the permeability of the conductor, and let's use copper as a, uh, a, a as an example, because usually a signal wire and a coaxial cable that's com that's a, a copper line, right? Uh, if I was broadcasting and it was, I'm trying to think of another copper. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, that's going to be one. Why do I say one? Because that's the relative permeability of copper. The relative permeability of copper. The only thing that's not a relative permeability of one is steel. That's the only thing you're gonna run into and we're not running into it yet. Okay, so there you go. One times four pi times 10 to the minus seven Henry's per meter, right? So one is the relative permeability, and this is the absolute permeability right back here. And so those would be two of the things that we've got in there. Now, what I want you to look at is, let's, let's say that we're, we're looking at copper. And uh, a, a good question, the question I always like to ask my students is, is the, uh, with, with AC running in your wall, is that running on the outside of the wire or the inside of the wire? And how about DC? Does DC run on the outside of the wire or does it run on the inside of the wire? And most people would say, well, uh, I think they both run on the inside of the wire. And the truth is that the way that we've designed the electrical system or by you know, coincidence or whatever, uh, they do. And, and I wanna show you that, that uh, they both run all through the wire that's there because, and I say this because, um, the frequency is so low. It's because the frequency is so low. It's 60 hertz. So let's look at that. Let's just look at the uh, skin depth penetration if into, into the copper if the frequency is 60 hertz. So that would be the square root I hope I can get this all in there, of one over pi times 60 hertz times, uh, well, uh, I'm just gonna say mu of the conductor because I've already written it there. And then uh, sigma of the conductor because I've already written that down there. And then I'll tell you what the answer is uh, as soon as I can put those numbers together, let's just uh, see that. Uh, pi times 60 times four times pi uh, minus seven times 16 minus nine, that equals whatever. Let's go one over that. Let's take the square root and that gives me 910,000. What? <laughs> oh God. Well, okay, gotta hit the pause button for a second here, folks. Okay, I'm back again. And yes, uh, I did realize when I, I, uh, I wasn't multiplying it by that, I was actually multiplying it by the resistance, which I wrote up here, and I forgot to take the next step, which was to take the reciprocal of the resistivity to find out what my uh, conductivity was. And multiplying the conductivity uh, times that, uh, and I uh, actually did not uh, uh, now do that. <laughs> Look, uh, I am getting there. I figured it out though, I think. I'm almost there. Uh, 
yeah, I, I'm not even sure if that's right, but uh, it seems to be. Just a second. I'm going to stop this again. Okay, I am back, and uh, yes, it was right. 0. 0.00822 meters. Or I could say that that was 8, uh, mil let's say 8.22 millimeters, right? Now, you probably realize that a, an AC signal line in your house uh, is, is not, a, that's almost a centimeter. <laughs> that's almost a centimeter, right? 8.22 millimeters is almost a centimeter. So uh, everybody's familiar with a centimeter and knows <laughs> that the wires inside your house are not a centimeter in diameter. So the truth is that the AC waveform that's traveling through them is actually penetrating the entire wire as it travels uh, along uh, that wire, all right? I just thought that you should know that. We're really at the end of time there. I wanted to compare this, though, to this. What if instead of 60 hertz, it was 100 megahertz, like is hitting your uh, radio antenna on your car, right? And I actually wrote down someplace here where the 100 megahertz was, and now I have not... Uh, uh, oh, no, no, 60 hertz, I got that. Now, where is the, oh, it's six microns. Six microns. So you can see the difference. Uh, when, that, when that 100 megahertz carrier wave from the radio station is hitting your antenna on your car, it's only penetrating that antenna, that conductor, six microns, uh, and that's causing the electric field on that antenna to vary. And of course, that's what you pick up inside your car, right? So at 60 hertz, it's 8.22 millimeters, but at 100 megahertz, it's only six microns. We'll talk more about this as we go along too, especially with metallic conductors in chapter eight. All right, see you guys in, in, a, in a little while.